You're listening to The Cash Podcast, creating affluence, success, and happiness with your financial surgeon, Adam Coach, president and portfolio manager at Libertas Wealth Management Group at LibertasWealth.com. Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. As always, the pandemic has been hard on all of us, obviously, Uh, many of us to a different extent than others. Uh, But one thing that has stuck out this past year is the tension created by COVID on relationships and marriages. So uh, today I'm talking with Teresa Harlow, author of two books on that very topic. So one of the books is called Combative to Collaborative, The Co-Parenting Code, and the other is Happily Divorced, a journey through divorce and co-parenting by the golden rule. And we're going to talk about how to deal with these relationship issues, the chaos, uh, whether you're married, single, or in the process of getting divorced. But before we get started, as always, just a few housekeeping items. If if this is your first time listening or watching, then thank you so much for joining us. The Cash Podcast is produced weekly, and as stated in the intro, Cash stands for creating affluence, success, and happiness, and that's our mission. My hope is for you to learn a little bit more on every single episode so that you become more successful, wealthier, happier, and more educated than you were before you started listening today. So please come back often, subscribe on both iTunes and YouTube, uh, and please note that any links, visuals, charts, and other educational resources uh, can be found on our website at libertaswealth.com. And today, obviously, we'll be talking about two different books, um, as well as Teresa's website. We'll, so we'll get to that. So so again, I've got Teresa Harlow on with me. And to formally introduce her, uh, she is a self-proclaimed co-parenting champion. And we're going to talk a lot about that. Uh, she's been a co-parent for over 20 years. And as mentioned earlier, she's written two books on the topic of co-parenting. Uh, again, Compative to Collaborative, The Co-Parenting Code and Happily Divorced, A Journey Through Divorce and Co-Parenting by the Golden Rule. Her mission is to take positive co-parenting from being an exception to being the expectation for all divorced parents, their kids, and their loved ones. Um, she's also spent more than 30 years in a corporate setting and as a business owner, helping individuals and teams to achieve feats that they thought were impossible. Uh, she advocates for the use of the golden rule to improve every relationship from your former spouse to a coworker, child, parent, or even an adversary. Uh, now a full-time author and speaker, uh, Teresa is dedicated to helping others adopt an empathetic mindset, reconcile combative behaviors, and enjoy more collaborative relationships. She's a member of the National Speakers Association in Thrive, Ohio, an organization dedicated to promoting women-owned businesses in Ohio. So, Teresa, thank you so much again for joining me. And I'm just really, really excited about this episode. I am too, Adam. Thanks for having me. It's it's really um, awesome to get to share this message with your audience. And it's it's so interesting because as we started talking in the fourth quarter last year, you, you've you already taught me so much that I didn't know. And I thought it was rather ironic that we said, hey, let's talk about doing maybe a podcast in uh, January in an article, and then let's maybe do an event in February. And then you tell me, did you say it's it's January is divorce month? <laughs> it is. It is. I don't know that we'll call it a time for celebration per se, right? No. <laughs> um, but the fact is a lot of people get through the holidays um, and they come out the other side of it and they make their New Year's resolutions and some people resolve to move on with their life. And yes. so they, they make that tough decision and, and they pull the ripcord, if you will. <laughs> so is that why that they made it divorce month is because you got, you get through the holidays, all that awkwardness is over and maybe now, now's a good time for a clean break. Well, that, and the fact that it is actually statistically true that more divorces are filed in January than any oh, wow. other month. And okay. specifically on the first Monday each January. And why so is I guess that? they just get through the holidays and they're like, okay, I'm done. It's the first business day of the month, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> is that, is that why it's, is it because it's the first business day of the month when everything's yeah, I guess open? So. That's so funny. Um, well, tell me what made you decide to, to go from 30 years in corporate America to focusing hundred percent of your energy on the topic of co-parenting? Well, you know, I wrote uh, Happily Divorced, the first of the two books, about a year and a half ago, and I'd been working on it for some time while I worked in corporate. Um, And uh, it all started that 20 years ago when um, we discussed divorcing when our son was six years old. And, um, you know, I, I... really was kind of surprised by something my ex-husband said at the time, my, my then husband, he said, Teresa, you realize you're going to miss half of your son's life. And, you know, I had contemplated lots of things about how divorce would look for me. Like, oh, I'll get to um, choose my own priorities of how I live my life and uh, 
be who I want to be and not have to answer um, for someone or, or change to, to meet their desires. But I hadn't thought so much about what that would mean in terms of the time lost with my son or the, the opportunities to engage with him in, in the various things we all enjoy as parents throughout the years. So contemplating that, I really thought, well, that, that can't be how this all plays out. I've got to do better than that. And really, we had already proven we weren't good communicators with one another. And I didn't know how to treat him in a way he wanted to be treated. So I thought, well, how can I, can I work to regain this time um, and, and get to a place where it's not so combative, it's not so difficult for us to spend time together so that when there are opportunities where we can be together with our son in you know, sports events or whatever uh, throughout his life, that it's not awkward for us, that we can both be there without having to worry about that. And I revert really kind of to a foundational place, which was to, to I, I didn't know how to treat him, but I knew how to treat myself. I knew what I would want to be treated like. So I kind of anchored everything around that. How would I want to be treated? Right. And yeah. I thought, okay, so, so as I, as I go down this path of thinking about um, what I'm going to say to him, what I'm going to, what actions I'm going to take then if, if I do only those things that would be acceptable to me, that should come at least closer to acceptable to him. So I started with that. Um, and then as, as we continued down this path, it actually um, helped him by me putting that out there, he reciprocated it naturally. Hmm. And, um, you know, that's kind of the universal law, right? You put right. an energy out there and it comes back to you. And it's true, it really works. Um, so other parents that we interacted with through sports and music and other things our son was involved in would comment to us a lot and teachers as well, how happy they were to see that we had handled our divorce with, as a parent, as parents this way. And, and mind you, the term co-parenting wasn't even like a, a thing then it, right. it wasn't a term. Um, so we didn't have a lot of, of models to go by. Um, but I, we just did what, what came naturally in, you know, general ethics of treating another person and went down that path. And, and people said, you know, I wish my parents would have done this for me when they divorced, or I wish my, yeah. my children who have divorced would do this so that I could get to see my grandkids. And it was really sad to me because I thought, you know, this wasn't so hard. I mean, it wasn't easy. Don't get me wrong. It sure. wasn't easy. And, you know, the ideal scenario certainly would be to, to be able to stay together, but it wasn't insurmountable. It wasn't hard. And so I right. thought, you know, I should be able to, I would love to see other people be able to do this and share with them how we did it and see if they can do it too and help other kids and, and even the parents avoid a lot of misery they put themselves through. It's almost like, um, Many things aren't easy, but they're simple. And yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I mean, it, it's um, you, we talked about the golden rule a couple of times. Once I think I, I think I said it out loud in your intro, but um, it sounds like that's where where the anchor is in a lot of these situations. So, how would you compare your two books? You know, you've got well, what are the major differences, I guess, between the two? Yeah. So, happily divorced was the first book, and it was really our story. It's how my ex-husband and I decided and, ch and moved forward with co-parenting our son. So I worked through things like the actual grief that you work through the stages of divorce and, and how that affected me emotionally and how it played out for us in our co-parenting relationship. And I tell our story along the way. So it's more of a memoir. I even yeah. share snapshots through our our lives, raising our son, some of us together and so forth. Um, but as I finished that book and got it out there, people kept asking me, that's great. You guys did a great job, but I don't know that I can do that. How can I do that? Like, <laughs> how do I deal with the problems I've got? And so I felt like I needed to go deeper okay. and really give people a roadmap because that's what people need is, is how, what is that path going to look like for me? And so I laid out this new book, Combative Learning Code, and I start with a topic 
and go into uh, what are the ways people handle this that aren't so great? What are the combative behaviors people demonstrate when they're dealing with a particular topic? Then when I tell some, I, I will um, put in some stories, some real life stories that either are mine or yeah. of other co-parents that I've um, encountered along the way and share you know, both good and bad situations and, and how those work for them. And what to do, and, what not to do kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And, and then I round it out with the do's and don'ts, which is the co collaborative opportunity, the collaborative approach to handling, handling any particular scenario in the book. Um, and finish it out with what I call the co-parenting code, which is how do you get to that empathetic approach to the, solving that particular problem so that you can get okay. the right mindset and process it through that lens. And um, what would you say if you, I don't, I know this is kind of hard to outline two full books and, and summarize them, but what would you say are the, are the common beliefs or I guess the tenets of, you know, co-parent parenting that, that seem to be true and maybe the things that just aren't true. So that kind of like the, the, the do's and don'ts, so to speak. Yeah. So, um, well, there's, there's a lot there that you just asked. And I know. That's what, I figured that'd be a problem. <laughs> Um, so the tenants, uh, really, I, I going to sound a little repetitive, but it's, it's always remembering the golden rule, always anchoring yourself back to, you know, if you're about to say something, say it to yourself, how did that land on, on you? Would you want somebody to say that to you? Would you want somebody to take the action you're about to take? And if the answer is no, don't do those things, change it. Um, so that's, that's tenant number one. And, um, you know, I, I think there's a, there's a whole host of ways that that can play out either good or bad. Okay. Um, but, uh, some of the things that people tend to, uh, believe that may not be so true are, it's not possible for me. Uh, that sounds great for you, but it's just not something <laughs> I can do. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I, I understand that idea. It's like, if you haven't seen it for yourself, lived it, you, you don't believe it's true. But what I tell people is that unless you absolutely know it's not true, assume it is possible. So you may or may not know. And if you don't know, assume you can try it and, and see where it takes you. What have you got to lose? You're not going to be in a worse place at the end of it. Right. Um, there's like a spectrum, I assume. I mean, I, we've all either been through or know someone who's been through a divorce, multiple people. And yeah. I think that there's a spectrum of how nasty things get and how difficult the relationship is after the divorce, especially. And I think that for some people it can get so difficult and, and seem so hopeless that they might feel that way. Um, I don't, the first thing I thought of, and this might sound ridiculous, but the first thing I thought of when you said that was uh, somebody who's been trying to lose weight and they've tried every diet and they said, it won't work for me. Um, so how much, what, what kind of off the cuff here, but what, what percentage would you say is uh, if I'm a, a co-parent, what percentage of the success of co-parenting is me and my efforts? Because I know the saying is, well, it's 50, 50, you know, is it though? I mean, is it really? more on you? And if, it, and, if, and if two people are working at 75%, is that where success comes? Well, so you can't control what the other person's doing, sure. but you can always control what you're doing. And you can also control how you react to what they do. Yeah. So, so that in itself brings you above the 50% because now you've got not only control over what you do, but control over how you react to them. That's a great point. So, I mean... I don't know what a percentage would be, but um, gosh, <laughs> let's just say it's at least 75%. So the odds are in your favor. Right. It seems, it seems optimistic at the least and it can't hurt to try, right? That's right. Is there anything else that you found that uh, kind of don't, you know, things that just simply aren't true about co-parenting? Oh. Well, true, true or not true about co-parenting. I don't know um, right off the top of my head what I would add there, but I can say there's a lot of don'ts that people should obviously avoid. And, and one of the biggest violations, you know, there, there's, there's various levels of, of combative behavior. There's the really egregious ones like, you know, telling your kids, well, your mom's a whore 
uh, and Yikes. you know, yeah. uh, she, she's, um, worthless or he's worthless. And, and in other words, talking the, the, uh, other parent down to the kids, you know, right. that, that has a lot of destructive, um, um, things about it for Many one, it, it, yeah, many levels. I mean, for one, the kid's probably thinking, well, gosh, does that mean I have those flaws too? Sure. Um, yeah. You know, and you, you may not be thinking that way, but that's how they're processing it. And, and two, even if they don't process it that way, so they take that information back to the other parent and tell them, <laughs> now what? Okay, so you've, you've really done nothing to improve the scenario, right? You've just made it Quite worse. Quite the opposite. Right. Yeah. So, you know, that's one of the, you know, big thing, big no nos is to not talk down to the other parent and, you know, not withhold visitation because you don't want this person around. I've seen this happen. I mean, yeah. I've seen women who I don't want him in my child's life. Well, it's not your child, it's the, both of your children. <laughs> and, um, you know, you just can't unilaterally make that decision. There are exceptions, right? If someone is experiencing domestic violence, sure, actual, of course. Um, threatening behaviors, you know, uh, maybe there's criminal activity involved. Those sorts of things are certainly disqualifiers uh, and, and take you down a different path. And there's all kinds of professional help in those scenarios. Um, yeah. So um, those are the more extreme examples, right? But but the ones that are really um, more common are the more subtle things, like the mom who doesn't share information about their child with the father. Um, you know, when my ex and I divorced back in 99, the, the school didn't even ask for his address. It was as oh, wow. if he didn't exist in the child's life. I was the, the custodial parent or not custodial, but I think they called it residential parent. Okay. And so they asked for my address and I had to like go to some extra effort to say, he's got an address too. Can you send him everything? And they're basically like, no, we don't do that. So it was up to me to provide it. Right. Yeah. yeah it's really interesting. Now, I think, yeah. And I think some of the school systems have come a ways since then and they're doing better. Um, but I'm sure there's a lot that don't. And so it, it falls on that other parent to do the kind thing and the, the thing that's going to serve their child most to actually offer that information up. Um, the other parent may know what to ask for, but there may be things they didn't know that, that you were getting. So just providing that courtesy. I mean, I don't know a mom that would think kindly on the idea of missing the opportunity to just pur purchase their school pictures for their child. For sure. and, and fathers miss out on this kind of thing. And not just fathers, but you know, in general, the father ends up on the short end of the stick in a lot of states where custody is predominantly given to the, the mom uh, with fathers getting a smaller slice of the parenting pie. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. So, so that's one of the more subtle things, but there's a lot of other things. Just, you got to be really careful about how you um, don't get drawn into combative behaviors, you know, just because the other person says something bad about you and it gets back to you by the, by the child doesn't mean it it's okay now for you to say, well, yeah, but he's this <laughs> and go yeah. down a, a path to try to justify Label. your behavior um, yeah, or helpful. whatever. Yeah. You were telling me a story before uh, and we didn't finish it. Tell me the story about how you, what was it? A, a, rec a correct, corrected course with your stepkids, mom or something like that. Some, yeah. What was that story? Yeah. So this is a good one. It's kind of long. So get no, ready. Sure. Okay. It seemed interesting. Um, yeah. So I've been in the relationship I'm in now for 13 years. Um, and, uh, he was divorced for about four years uh, when we met. So it wasn't like I was coming into the scene when they were divorcing or anything like that. There had been a gap of time. Um, having said that, you know, uh, he has two kids. And at the time they were like seven and 10 years okay. old. And, um, uh, you know, with that, their mom um, was reasonably 
I guess, threatened or apprehensive about a new female coming on the scene that might influence her children. Sure. I went through the same thing when my ex uh, met someone and, and brought them into, brought her into my son's life. So I get that. Um, but we really ended up having a pretty contentious relationship for uh -huh. the first 10 years that um, my yeah. fiance and I were together. And, um, you know, I, I, I didn't really apply some of my own <laughs> learnings to this. I just basically wanted to avoid the confrontation and not cause more trouble. And, and I stepped back from it. I'm just like, I forget it. I'm just, I'm just tapping out. I'm going to step back. <laughs> and, um, you know, that, that meant that I missed out on some things with those kids um, I really didn't get a chance to spend much time with um, th either the daughter or the son, particularly the daughter, her being um, the first child and older. Um, so, you know, flash forward 10 years and uh, our stepdaughter is in uh, a college sport hmm. and um, her mom would very frequently get like little things for the team to give them before a game. Like maybe it was cookies or maybe it was something else, uh, little trinkets or whatever. Well, this one Easter, she put together these little Easter baskets uh, for the girls. She assembled them from things like from the dollar store. It wasn't any big deal, but it was a nice little gesture, something kind to do for them. And so she gave those to the team and one of them ended up on my kitchen counter. And yeah. So I asked my stepdaughter, I'm like, oh, what's that? And she says, oh, that's a, um, an extra basket that my mom made for the team. She said to bring it to you. And I thought, wow, okay, so this is a step in the right direction. Right, this, this, this actually could be an icebreaker. It, it's pretty um, amazing that she, she acknowledged my existence and did something kind, you know, so mm -hmm. I, was, I was lifted by that. So um, my stepdaughter proceeds to tell me, yeah, you know, my mom caught a little grief from one of the other moms about this. She thought it was was ridiculous. I'm like, what? Why? Okay. What's what's the big deal? She said, yeah, I guess uh, they got into it a little bit and had a little confrontation. And I'm like, wow, well, that's oh, crazy. Geez. Well, I should, I thought to myself, you know, it's been sitting here a couple of days. I should probably thank her. <laughs> right. Duh. Maybe just thank her for uh, doing a nice thing and and do the common uh, courtesy. Um, so I did that. I sent her a little text and I said, Hey, thank you for thinking of me with this Easter basket. It's really sweet. And I think it was a nice thing, um, to, um, acknowledge me. And she says, she responds in text. We had this text back and forth. She says, Oh, thank you very much for, um, saying that I really needed to hear it. And I responded, well, I heard you cut some grief over these, how ridiculous is that? What what in the world? And she says, yeah, the woman actually got up in my face and she <laughs> says, well, do you want to take it outside? What? And I'm like, what? <laughs> what? I mean, we're talking like late 40s, <laughs> early 50s oh age here. And I'm like, who does that? I mean, we've went full on redneck, right? <laughs> and um, knowing that my um, <clears throat> my stepdaughter's mom was a college athlete herself. She's no shrinking violet. I mean, she works out every day. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, okay. So I text her back and I said, well, my question's this, could you take her? And, <laughs> oh, and <no>. so, <laughs> so that little bit of humor went a long way to kind sure. of open up a conversation, open up communication. All right. So we're making headway, right? Yeah. Two weeks later, their stepson or my stepson was playing uh, high school sport for the first time. He had had some uh, health issues earlier on and hadn't played high school sports up until his senior year. And he had uh, become friends with a group of boys that played um, on the varsity team for um, volleyball. Okay. And uh, so he joined the team at their, um, at, at their suggestion but being he was playing for the first time, he wasn't put on the varsity squad. He was put on JV. So he played most of his sure. games on JV. However, this one particular week, the coach said, you're going to get to play varsity. And I don't know if it was because other 
players were out or whatever the case, but we were all excited and we're like, yay, he's going to get to play, you know, in the varsity game and have his moment. Mm -hmm. And so we all went to the game. Well, I asked, where's, where's your, where's his mom? And I was told that she couldn't be there because she had a business trip and she did a lot of business travel and there was no way to reschedule it with the short notice that we okay. had. Yeah. So she couldn't be there. And here I am snapping pictures away and doing the mom thing. And I thought, you know, what would I want somebody to do for me if I couldn't be here as the mom? And so I shot her a quick text with those pictures and awesome. she responded. Yeah, you know, and it's such a simple thing. That's what yeah. I'm saying. It's so simple. And so she responded with, wow, thank you so much for sharing these. Isn't it? Isn't he great? Isn't that awesome? I wish I could be there. And I'm like, well, I thought you might appreciate having these. And yeah. so from, from that moment, Adam, I can't even tell you, it was like night and day, the before and after. We went from, uh, you know, I would ask, hey, can I'm you take a picture of me? Like, yeah. Yeah, to, you know, I wanted to have a picture taken with their daughter at her um, high school graduation, I think it was, or senior night or whatever it was. And it was like, oh, you know, get somebody else to do it to her offering to take my picture with her daughter wow. when she graduated college. And so full on 180. Yeah, turnaround. doesn't get much and more successful than that. That's right. And you know what? The the moral of the story is, is, is twofold. One- uh, do what what you know to do. Treat somebody else how you want to be treated. And mm -hmm. I don't know why I didn't think of it before 10 years had passed, but thank God sure. I finally thought of it. And number two, and this is huge, it's never too late. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter if it's been 10 years or, you know, 20 years. What have you got to lose if you just put that olive branch out there? So. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, that's my long drawn out. <laughs> no, that's a great story though. I mean, Tale. it kind of goes to show that I mean, anything can happen, and the power of positivity. And I think um, I, my dad, when I was growing up in his office, I used to walk home from school every day, and I'd see in his office the attitude quote. And it's long, but the end says, you know, that ninety percent of life's what happens to you, and ten percent. Um, I'm sorry, ten percent of life's what happens to you, and ninety percent of life is how you react to it. And I think that that's so much again, what gives you, gets you above that 50% in terms of not only effort and a total effort between two parents, but success overall. And I think right. it works with, you know, not only marriages and divorce, but sisters, brothers, friends. Oh um, yeah. What's, what would you say is the best piece of advice that you have for divorced parents? If you were to pick one. Well, I would say to work on getting into that empathetic mindset. Hmm. Um, you know, that's the anchor of everything else. Uh, if we want to talk more about, um, you know, the, the pragmatic things that you can do, I can, I can go down that path a bit because I think it's really important. Um, one of the, the practical things we did that relieved stress for all of us my son, my ex and me, and, and just made life abundantly easier was the simple choice to live close. Okay. And we you lived- You mean in proximity to one another? Yeah, within proximity. Okay. Um, so we lived a quarter mile as the crow flies. Wow. Um, and that enabled us to obviously get him back and forth very quickly, not spend, you know, lose that time in a commute somewhere. Um, it also allowed us to get back and forth to each other's house for items forgotten. It allowed our son yeah. to interact with both neighborhoods. If there was a birthday Friends. party, he could get to it. Um, and uh, it, it really enabled so many things to, to be easier. And it, it sounds like, well, that's the, that's the best advice you've got is to live close. Well, <laughs> it, it really, there, there's a lot of advice, but, but that's one of the things I found that, that set us up for so much else. I mean, there's parents that struggle to get to the school functions because maybe they live 30 minutes away or, sure. or farther. You know, if you're in one of those metro centers, like in New York, it could be an hour and a half right. uh, when you don't live very far from each other at all. So whatever you can do to, to live closely um, in proximity to each other, 
um, the easier you're going to make it on yourself and, and on your child. I think that in order to get all this advice between, uh, I, I've got an event I'm going to share in a second here that you and I are doing together, but uh, there's probably no shortage of advice that you could probably provide. Right? <laughs> but um, I've got I've got an interesting question for you, baby. Um, is there anybody that your approach doesn't work for? You know, does it work for everybody? Uh, n- no, unfortunately, it doesn't. Um, and it, we've already mentioned those that the that are in the domestic violence situations uh, yep. um, and, and if there's been criminal activity that's, you know, beyond the bounds. Um, and of course there are those that are just simply abandoned by a spouse. Oh, um, sure. yep. The, the um, father or mother uh, leaves and leaves no forwarding address or just drops off the planet or says, I don't want right. anything to do with you or whatever the case. And there's, there's help out there for, for single parents. Um, I, I list some of that help in the book, okay. um, in Good. the second book, combative to collaborative. And, um, I would also say that there are a lot of professionals, you know, psychologists and, and family counselors that can help. And I would encourage any one in that scenario to get help, not only for yourself, but for your child, because yeah, they're awesome. going to probably need it to understand um, that this isn't their fault. Sure. And, and that they, you know, still have a family. It's just changed in dynamic and to figure out how to move forward with that. What, um, you know, we, we've talked a lot about people who, have, who are either going through a divorce or are divorced. I mean, does, any of the work that you've done, your books, I mean, d- does anybody else benefit from, you know, if they were to pick up your book, you know, if I wasn't divorced, would it be worth me picking up both books, the new one that's coming out? Sure. Um, well, for one, you mentioned earlier, a lot of people are affected by divorce. It's not just sure. the parents and the kids. It's it's that extended family. It's even the friends and and your coworkers if you're if you find yourself in a in a very stressful scenario. So I call that those beyond the immediate family, the collateral damage, right? Okay. Um, and so anyone, everyone's affected by divorce in one way or another. So you can all benefit from understanding how to interact with someone that's going through that process or lives in that um, model. Um, beyond that, though, there's a, there's a deeper message. This message of moving from combative to collaborative transcends divorce and co-parenting. I mean, we find combative relationships all over the place in oh, our yeah. families, in our work lives. And the, the premise of, of shifting your thinking to an empathetic place and living by the golden rule works for everyone. Yep. And you can apply it across all of your relationships. Um, so I, I really would love to see this picked up by not only the professionals who serve families in distress, but also employers. Because look, if you've got employees, chances are some of them are divorced or are co-parents going through this and providing them help so that they can be happier and and perform at the the level that they're able to uh, to maximize that can benefit everyone. Um, so you know, I give uh, talks on on this topic to to all kinds of organizations. Okay, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I mean, for me, you know, where this hits me personally is. Um, you know, I lost my brother three and a half years ago and we had a great relationship. Mm-hmm. But after that happened, I remember having a conversation specifically multiple times with one of my best friends who hadn't spoken to his brother in years. Oh. And just kept, you know, unlike, unlike divorce, where you have a, a chance to make it better later when there's a death in the family, you don't. And so, it's yeah. like, you know, to take advantage while you can of um, living by that golden rule and, and, you know, treating other people like you want to be treated and worst case scenario. I mean, as long as you don't react adversely to whatever's happening as they return fire, let's just say hypothetically, yeah. um, at least you're making efforts. And the good news is that relationship. Now they're talking and hanging out again. And so yeah. I think that what I can't agree with you more that I think that this helps everybody, not just people who are divorced. 
Yeah. And you know, when, when things are off the rails like that, if you continue to make the effort to um, recover, uh, if nothing else, even if you fail at it uh, with that other person, you can live with yourself. That's true. You That's know, you can live with yourself and you can say, well, I did everything I could. Yep. Um, it's liberating, I bet. And, and just because someone isn't receptive at one point doesn't mean that down the road they won't be. Um, you got to meet with somebody where they're at, right? And, yeah. and they may not be ready to accept your, whether it's your forgiveness or your um, acceptance of them or, or to apologize to them, whatever Just the case. Discussion. Just bad yeah. timing. Yeah. Yep. Right. Well, uh, I mentioned the event a, a few minutes ago. So you and I are going to be doing an event together, a live event that we're going to record so if anybody wants to be on this event, uh, we're going to start sending out um, inv invitations, um, inv information to get registered. It's free. Uh, it's going to be on February 11th. That's Thursday, February 11th. So we got a good month left here at 5 p.m. It is going to be a virtual event for obvious reasons. Um, and like I said, anybody can register for free and we are going to record it. So if you, uh, if you don't register, obviously you'll never get the recording, but if you register, we'll send the recording to you afterwards uh, so that you can watch it. But obviously if you're there live, we'll be taking both live and anonymous questions through the chat and Q and a. So if you have questions and you don't want to you know, anybody to know who's asking, obviously we'll keep that confidential uh, yeah. for obvious reasons as well. So um, before we close out, I mean, how can people get a hold of you, Teresa? Well, I, I did want to add something to the sure, event yeah, yeah. too, you know, um, and I know some people may not be able to join live, but if you can, I want to tell you a couple of things. One, I don't do boring. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to make it, I know this is a heavy topic. I know that, but we're going to make it fun. I'm going to provide you some opportunity to interact so that you're not just sitting there listening to me talk because <laughs> that can get old fast. Sure. So, you know, I would encourage people to join live. Um, so that they can ask questions, they can take advantage of the, the, the dynamic that I want to create with the people live in the, um, in the chat or in the Zoom. And if you want to, um, if you want to keep it confidential, we could even, uh, you could even share your camera, but wear a full blown mask, like it's Halloween, you know, nobody will know. Yeah, you are. there you go. <laughs> well, masks are a thing, you know, right, exactly. Yeah. So you've got one laying around, throw it on. <laughs> oh, and as far yeah, as how so, to get a hold of you and your your website, uh, you've got two websites actually, TeresaHarlow.com, and that's Teresa without an H. Um, so T E R E S A H A R L O W, TeresaHarlow.com. And then your other website is coparentingcode.com, and that's, that's coparenting right. without a hyphen. So just coparenting, no, no dots, no spaces, no hyphens or anything. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add in terms of contact information for you? Yeah. So on the website, there's uh, a submission form where you can submit questions. You can reach me that way. My email address is on there as well as my office phone number. So feel free to use any of those methods to, to contact me and get more information about uh, having me speak or, or just about co-parenting in general um, or beyond co-parenting if you have other combative relationships that you're struggling with because I, I've really had my fair share of those that I've, I've been able to turn around using the same, the same concept. Yeah. And I think that if anybody wants to, you know, even if it's not necessarily because you're divorced or because you have any relationship issues, then awesome. Good for you. Right. But uh, right. Uh, if, if you're considering uh, having someone like Teresa, maybe speak at your organization, maybe check out the free live event that we're doing and you can kind of get a taste of what it might be like. There you go. All right. Well, that's it for today's show. Um, please, uh, by all means, feel free to share this episode with your friends and family. Um, if you'd like to discuss any uh, of the information we discussed today, head over to Teresa's website at TeresaHarlow.com or CoParentingCode.com. Um, of course, if you have any questions for me in terms of how divorce or the potential divorce affects your finances, financial planning, retirement planning, estate plan, then please feel free to head over to our website at LibertasWealth.com. Um, and you can contact us or even set up an introduction appointment on our calendar. Um, 
you never ever have to be a client to ask a question. Um, so as I always say, there are thousands and thousands of podcasts out there. You chose to give ours a listen today. So thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, be sure to subscribe on iTunes and YouTube. We're on both. And remember, you can sign up at LibertasWealth.com to get these updates, as well as other screencasts, videos, and articles delivered directly to your inbox. Uh, feel free to follow us on Facebook at Facebook.com forward slash Libertas Wealth. I'm also on Twitter at Adam Koch and on Instagram at Financial Surgeon. So thank you again so much for joining uh, and hanging out with us today. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, Adam. Thank you for listening to The Cash Podcast with your financial surgeon, Adam Koch. To see any charts or images that were mentioned in this show or to check out additional articles, videos, and other educational resources, head over to LibertasWealth.com.